Well, welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Dr. Anna Wasesha, President of Middlesex Community College, located right here in Middletown, Connecticut. And today my guests are Lynn Paterini, who is an adjunct professor here, and Brendan Cleary, who's a student. And what we're going to be talking about is maybe a little bit about the writing process, but then also about publishing uh, and uh, self-publishing. So, I mean, it's, uh, those are all really amazing topics, I think, or robust topics. So, Brendan, yes. let's just start with, when, when did you first begin to write something that was creative? Not I, an assignment for a course, <laughs> shall we say. It would have to be about two or three years ago. I was actually homeschooled for most of my life, starting in eighth grade. And there are these things in homeschool called co-ops, which are basically these big gatherings of a bunch of homeschoolers who kind of teach each other like classes and stuff. And so there was a creative writing class. And before that, I've always been intimidating by writing. Like I never really had patience kind of like white, but slowly after just training myself over the course of a few years, I've gotten to a point where I can write like a thousand, two thousand words in one sitting. Well, when I started, like it was super hard for me just to focus for like a page because I um, have ADD. Do you write in longhand or do you? you uh, I type. You type. Yeah. When I write in longhand, it's a lot more uh, freeing for me. Because, like, I feel like there's less stress than, like, writing, typing, longhand. I don't know, it seems like a less, like, low-risk situation, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. But mostly, I mostly type. Like, I write just to get, like, ideas and thoughts out, and then I usually type it up. Let me ask Lynn about that, that idea of, cur- you know, cursive, actually mm-hmm. having contact with the paper and a pen. What do you, what's your writing style? It's, it's very organic, and it's similar to what mm-hmm. you were describing, yep. that I will, I keep journals with me in my yep. car everywhere, and I'm known to pull over on the side of the road and start making notes when mm-hmm. an idea comes. I, this last book, I sat down and typed the whole thing out which I have never done before. It's always been written longhand Mm -hmm. in notebooks Mm -hmm. and then converted. I I am not a planner though. Mm -hmm. I just basically get the whole 65 to 80,000 words down and then I go back and start editing and figuring out where the holes in the story and where I need to fix. So you don't outline the story? No. You don't? No, I just go with it and see what happens. So now tell me a little bit about your well, I don't, I don't know where to start. At some point, you wrote for the first time creatively, mm-hmm. and then ultimately you wrote complete novels. I started with, well, the, the book or mm-hmm. way back when? Way back when. Oh, gosh. Way back when, when I was in high school, I wrote terrible, terrible poetry and just awful poetry. Yeah. And my high school art teacher actually said to me, you should be an art major. You should go to college. So I got into visual arts and then eventually went back into writing. And eventually you wrote a novel. I wrote a novel. two or three. Yeah. Yeah, The first one was I was traveling a lot for work. And you get to the point where going out to dinner is fun. You know, going out and seeing bands play, that's all fun. But I just wanted to stay in my hotel room. And I didn't want to watch TV. I didn't want to do anything else. And I just started writing this book. And it just came about. It's a great story. I want to hear more about that. But we have to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk some more about the writing process. Well, we're back, and it's Middlesex Moments Radio Show. And this week, I'm talking with Lynn Paterini, who teaches English and Composition and Literature here, is a part-time instructor at Middlesex, and Brendan Cleary, who is a student. And I, and so we, over the break, we were talking about a little about the creative process. Yep. So I'm going to ask you, are you taking courses in creative writing, or are you writing creatively on your own? Not right now. I write creatively on my own. It's kind of been a struggle to like both deal with housework and kind of just to find the time to write. About like a year ago, when I first started really taking creative writing seriously, I told myself that I would write a thousand words a day. Ah, yeah. Because there's this quote by Stephen King that says that he writes a thousand words a day. Yeah, he's and, um, so <laughs> prolific. He would, yeah. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it can be very stressful. But I've kind of been getting just like in the first few months, it was really rough. 
because every time I would miss that 1,000 words, I kind of be like, okay, to make up for it, I need to make 2,000 words tomorrow. And if I don't do that, I need to write 3,000 words the next day. And that kind of, the only thing that it um, achieved, it just made me super stressed out. Mm -hmm. So I, I still try to write like a decent amount, but I don't let the fact that like when I don't write, I don't let that really weigh on me. You know, I've decided that like, it's not really the amount of words that matters, it's very just the actual words. Like you can write like a thousand words and they can just be terrible, but if you write just one sentence that you can consider gold, then I think that one sentence is worth more than that a thousand words. Exactly, right. So, so like, quality over quantity. Exactly. So. But you did, you did have a creative writing course to some degree when you were in, uh, being homeschooled. Yeah. And there the, was quite was, a few. And was that your only experience in a course that was promoting creative writing? Yeah, we never really, I think like a few times we did that in like public school, but back then I was so easily distracted. I would write like three sentences and just get bored. I just like never really finish it. So when you think ahead, are you thinking about writing short stories or longer pieces of prose? Well, I definitely want to like my first collection, and this is looking like way in the future, five, ten years from now. But I definitely want to have a collection of short stories out first before I try and like write an actual novel. So let me ask Lynn, when you're working with students like Brendan, do you mm -hmm. advise them to read short stories? To, to do oh, a lot yes. of yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, do a lot of reading yep. and there's I, I wish I had it with me. There's a great Ray Bradbury quote where he talks about lurking in libraries and reading terrible books and wonderful <laughs> books and, and he goes on and on and he said, And you must write every day for twenty thousand days. Yep. And it doesn't matter if you're writing science fiction or what you're writing yeah. and just keep doing it. And off of that, I, something that you said mm -hmm. before about having a set time or a set uh, yep. word amount to do every single day, I met Walter Mosley this summer at Thriller Fest in New York City, and we were talking, and he said, you just got to write every day. Yeah. He said, even if you edit one paragraph, and like you yep. said, get that golden sentence, yeah. just do one thing, but if you write every day, your characters will keep talking to you, but when you stop doing it, they get upset, yeah. and they're going to go someplace else and find it, you, you're going to lose your muse. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's you, they feel neglected. That's a great yes. concept. I love it. Yeah. Well, so do you You have a daily time during the way you always write? Yeah, you've got your discipline working for I, you? Usually I yeah. do. I have a set routine. I, I must admit the last month it's kind of gone awry, but I do have a set routine. And during the summer, I have a cohort that we started going on laptop dates. And she is an amazing writer, too. She finished her first novel this summer. And we were meeting at the Harmony Cafe down here in downtown Middletown and writing. And there was just such great energy in that mm -hmm. place. And she, like I said, she managed to write a whole novel. I, I got half of mine done. And we would just go different places where we could sit and write. And if you have a writing partner, it yeah, really helps definitely. to be committed. Because if you're in the middle of doing some a scene and you get stuck, you could bounce ideas off each other. Mm -hmm. Or I have a blog that hasn't been that consistent. Um, in the summer it was, it hasn't been in the last month, where I would write a blog post and say, okay, can you look at this and tell me if this is what is going on here? And she'd look and say, yeah, that's postable, or yeah, I don't yeah. think you want to word it exactly that way. Maybe let's tweak it a little bit. And mm -hmm. so. Also in the coffee shop, do you hear people talking? Does it help to be in the middle of a space where people are having conversations? It, it does when I get stuck, but honestly, if, if I'm in the flow and my characters yeah. are talking in my head, I don't hear anything that goes on around me. And when it's broken, that's I, I almost it's almost like waking up from a dream that if the concentration is broken, and I don't know if this happens to you too, that all of a sudden you look around and go, oh, yeah, how'd I get here? Yeah, that happens. <laughs> and it's just such a wonderful feeling mm -hmm. when it does, because you're, you're so in sync with what you're getting down on the yeah. paper. Right, right. And you've, you've got a sense of your own voice. You must. Yes. Right. I do. Because that's another thing authors really yeah. have to figure out. And are you, do you have a confidence about your own voice that what you're writing on the page is is you. For a long time, I didn't. Like, for a long time, I was trying to find my voice. 
And for the past few months, I've kind of gone through these phases where I'm like, oh, this is my voice. And then I write something else. I'm like, no, this is my voice. You know, and I think, like, I kind of get who I am as a writer and kind of like what I want to accomplish through my writing. But who knows if, like, six months, I'm just going to write something completely different. It'd be like, no, this is what I should do, and I'm only going to write stuff like this. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's definitely, I feel like, just for me as a writer, I'm still a work in progress. Well, I think that makes sense, yeah. you know. I mean, I think that scientists figure yeah. things out very early in their lives. Mm-hmm. But living, you know, the experience of living gives you the perspective, I yeah. think, as a humanities hist- historians need to... They need to see yeah. longer periods of time, so you mm. got you got to be patient yeah. with the totally. aging process. <laughs> but yeah, totally. <laughs> like I've kind of realized to myself, hey, I'm still 19. Mm-hmm. Like I shouldn't be disappointed that I haven't been published or anything right. like that, because I still have. Honestly, like most writers don't really kind of like get the big break until they're like 30s or 30s. Right. Exactly. So mm-hmm. now, are you active in the creative writing club here on campus? Yes, I am. And is is that your group that has asked Lynn to offer the self-publishing workshop? It is. Yes. Yeah. So and thank you. No problem. <laughs> I want to plug something at the XK. Mm-hmm. I, I having an event coming up actually, similar to you, it's in a writers workshop November seventh. It's going to be a flash fiction workshop where we're basically for an hour. I'm going to be kind of like explaining in telling people about and hopefully even actually having people write some flash fiction. And what is flash fiction? So what flash fiction is, is it kind of like writing a story in a limited amount of words. So the standard is a thousand, but due to the time we're going to be doing a hundred. And there's a bunch of different terms for these on the internet. Like for instance, story written in a hundred words or less is called a drabble. A story written in 50 words or less is called a dribble. Like, yeah. No, there's something really endearing about those terms. Um, mm-hmm. And I actually, I don't know if we have time, but I did write a drabble just to show, sure. like... Sure. Okay, so this is called Don't Hire from Craigslist by Brendan Cleary. And I'm going to read and then I'm kind of going to use it as an example to explain what exactly, when you're writing a drabble or a dribble, or like a piece of flash fiction, what you're trying to accomplish. All right, so... Don't hide from Craigslist. Natasha Fellini was a tall human in a suit, overdressed for the occasion. After hours of waiting, she was finally at the front of the line. Yes, the man said, I'm here to have my head replaced. What's wrong with your current one? Looks fine. Looks fine. Are you sure about that? She gestured at her head dramatically. The man put on his glasses and took a closer look. That's a perfectly adequate hummingbird head you got there, ma'am. I really don't see the problem. The man would soon be fired from the cross-species head replacement clinic. Mm-hmm. Now, so, what that is, even though it was only a hundred words, and that's like the idea behind any flash fiction, no matter how many words, is that you want to tell a complete story within that word limit. Right. And even though it's like a very small story and kind of more of a joke than anything, there's still a beginning, middle, and the end. Yes, right. Yeah. And it's a drabble. Yeah. That's a, we've learned Perfect a new call. word. I've learned yep. a new word today. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay, so that's November 7th. When, yep. it, when is the other? I'm November 16th. November yes. 16th. During the community hour, and I'll be going into self and indie publishing. I have, it's a, it's a short presentation. It may be a half hour or so, and then plenty of time for questions and such. And so it should be fun. It'll mm-hmm. definitely be interesting. I, is, how large a phenomenon is this? Do you, you know? I mean, how many people are publishing their own books? And Five, mostly through Amazon, right? 5,000 books a day. Wow. <laughs> yes. And it's yes. growing, right? Yes. It's growing, yeah. And it's growing. And those are, at, I'm glad you said that because that's based, based on 2015 stats. I, I think that comprehensible we, to me. That 5,000 a day come out and... It, it really depends on what you want to do, what your focus is. I find Amazon really easy to use, easy to work with. I do graphics. I have a graphics degree actually from Tungsis Community College. So I do my own covers and such, but everything can be plotted out. If, if you're not a design person, you can find someone to do the design and graphics for you. Highly recommend having outside editors come yeah. in and look at your work before you yeah, publish fine. anything. And part of the workshop is my own experience, good and bad, with outside editors. And things, 
things along those lines. So it's going to be pretty comprehensive. And when someone leaves from there, they'll at least have a checklist of what they have to do to get ready to publish so they don't embarrass themselves. We always want to <laughs> avoid that. Well, we got to come back and talk some more about that. But right now we have to take a break and we'll be back in just a second. Well, we're back to Middlesex Moments Radio Show. Brandon Cleary, student Hello. here at Middlesex, Lynn Paterini, who teaches here, and we're talking about self-publishing in our last session, last section of our show. <laughs> but I, you mentioned having good editors come in. So how do you yes. even find an editor? My first editor I found through a friend. She publishes self-help books and said, you have to talk to this woman. She was out of Danbury. And um, she did an okay job. The The one advice that I can give to you is yeah. do not edit your own work. Have, have somebody else get that extra set of eyes on it. Um, my next editor came recommended also. And then I have a niece that has a technical writing degree from Portland State. And one book she did a great job on. And the second one, I, you know, she did okay, but... She has stuff going on in her life, too. She's actually a freelance writer that makes a living freelance writing. So I, I search, and I continue the search. And I have three more business cards from people that may or may not work for me. Mm -hmm. I've come to the realization you're never going to reach perfection. Yep. Well, it's, it, yes, that's right. And yeah. even Hemingway has typos in his yeah. books. <laughs> so so the, are they digging deeper, though, than typos and they do. punctuation? They do. I need what I need is a line editor. I need someone that is going to go line by line and look at the punctuation and look at the grammar and look at. I know where my weaknesses lie, and as much as I try to self correct, I don't get all of them. The story editor, I have beta readers. And what, now, what is a beta reader? A beta Our vocabulary reader are, lesson today is rich. There are people who don't get paid that volunteer to read your work, and some are part of. I'm a member of Romance Writers of America. And some are with my RWA group. Some mm. are other fellow writers that I've met along the way that like my writing. One of them is a friend of mine that she, well, she's become a friend. She's actually my massage therapist because I get migraines, so I go once a week. <laughs> it's not a self-indulgent thing. And she just loves my characters. And she said, so I want to read and I want to make sure that you're treating them well. Mm -hmm. And every time I see her, it's like, when are Zach and Max, Maxie going to appear again in another book? And so, I keep telling... Do they? They. Yeah. It's on my computer. It's a work in progress. It's not the one I'm working on now. Because I'll work on it in spurts. That I, I have it in my head, but I'm, I don't have the... The characters aren't talking to me yet. They mm -hmm. give me little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. So when I get those, I'll write maybe a couple thousand words at a time yeah. or something. Nothing that's going to get mm -hmm. to the 65,000 minimum that I need to actually publish. And that's, yep. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a lot of thousand word days yes. Yes. put together. <laughs> but what I was curious about is, do, the, do you have your same characters that go from one book to the next? No, yeah. no. So you have to create these people that you kind of, in a way, fall in love with and mm -hmm. then discard them and move on to the next set. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I hope that my readers, when they get done, I, I love books that when I finish them, I'm like, oh, I'm not done with these people yet. Mm -hmm. I want to hear more about their lives. Yeah. So I'm hoping that they get the same sensation. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Sayers got me started on that with Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane, right? The two... Have you ever read Dorothy Sayers? No. Oh, my heavens. Uh, first book I read was Gaudy Night. I read them all, but Harriet Vane is a very distinguished woman. This is probably the 1920s in Great Britain. And Lord Peter Whimsey is her husband, and they solve crimes together. And they're just so genteel. And over the course of many, many books, I don't know, 10 or so more books, it, you, you do really fall in love with them and never want to see them stop mm -hmm. doing what they're doing. I mean, I think Ian Fleming did that with James Bond. You know, he created a character that... You yeah. just want to go back mm -hmm. to, and there's one point at which he got married, but the wife was tragically killed, yeah. right? So you didn't have to carry the wife character yeah. into the next book. So, Brendan, what are your favorite books, and what, what, as you think about what you read these days, what yeah. really stands out? Well, I've um, one of my favorite books I just finished recently was uh, *The Fisherman* by John Langing, which is this really awesome literary horror book that could be classified under this subgenre known as weird fiction that I've been into since early 2015. And it's really hard to classify 
weird fiction. All I can describe it as, it's too weird for mainstream fiction and too literary for horror. It's kind of like a weird mix between the two of them that kind of like looks at kind of like themes and ideas that kind of like you wouldn't really like seeing a lot of other work. It definitely has like a sur surrealistic feel to it, very dreamlike imagery a lot of the times. For instance, The Fisherman is kind of like on one level about a tale of loss between these two people who have both lost their families you know, in different instincts and how they kind of bond together through fishing. And on another tale, it's this weird cosmic horror story about this, like, ancient leviathan that, like, lurks, like, underneath the ocean in this weird parallel dimension. And so what's cool about weird fiction is how it's able to combine, like, the literary with these kind of, like, far out, kind of, to be frank, pulpy, kind of cheesy themes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always, since I was young, I was always into, like, anything speculative. Like, I love it when a book just has, like, this weird kind of, like, science fiction or, like, fantastical, fantastical twists that is kind of thrown into that. And I try to put that into my own writing as well. Sure, yeah. So. They end up yeah. being your in the influences on Definitely, you. definitely. Kind of, like, Lovecraft was an early influence on me, even though I feel like some of his stuff honestly he's very hit and miss like when he hicks he's really good but when he misses eh but uh what's cool about him is that kind of like his popularity was like doing networking which as mm -hmm. you were talking about because like during his time he wasn't really that well known but because he kind of had this like circle of friends and other authors that he like wrote to and stuff his work persisted they were known as the lovecraft circle at the time and created this whole almost subgenre of work that continues today. Definitely a different version. I'm sure Lovecraft wouldn't agree with some of the uh, people who are currently writing it, but they, they're definitely all inspired by Lovecraft. And it's just amazing to me that someone can have that lasting uh, impression, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. can like continue in that way. So writing can be a very solitary experience, although now I've learned a new concept, which is a laptop date. So yes. it can be kind of <laughs> well, kind of solitary, but social at the same time. Just the opposite, actually. Like, I feel like writing cannot exist in a bubble. Mm -hmm. You know, you need mm -hmm. other influences on your writing. You can't just be like, okay, I want to be a writer without reading anything. You need to have some sort of influence or just some sort of thing to draw from to be a writer. I definitely feel like... I am who I am as a writer because of everything I've read, everything I've experienced. Take that all away from me, and I'm not really a writer anymore, because I have like nothing to write about, no real view or angle to write anything on it. Right. I'd say he's well on the path, yes. wouldn't you, Lynn? Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. That's, that's such a great way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, writing on the surface may seem like a solitary experience, but I definitely think it's like a communal experience. Like every time, every word mm. you write is just influenced by dozens of people. Some people you may realize, some people you may not. It's when I did yeah. the creative writing workshop, mm -hmm. I forced people to submit stuff for publication. Yeah. Like that was one of the requirements of the workshop because one of my professors right. in graduate school yep. said at the end, yeah. you are sending something mm -hmm. out and I will, if you don't, if you say, I don't know where to send this, yeah. I will give you a list. And she had us bring envelopes yeah. <laughs> in with our work and she collected them and that was part of the yep. final that these are being sent to various publications. Let me know if what you get back as far as if it's accepted or rejected mm -hmm. and if they're specific or if it's a form letter. And it's just part of the process yeah. that you put it out there. Mm -hmm, and definitely. if people like it, great. If they don't like it, that's okay, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. remarkable. There's, oh, sorry. Yes, There's actually ahead. this uh, great website that I use called the Submission Grinder, which mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, you know that? I've heard of it, yes. It's uh, really useful. It takes like just hundreds of different magazines and publishers and lists them all on one website. So, like, let's say, hey, I have a science fiction story that's 3,000 words. You type it into their search bar, and their show publishers are looking for this specific type of story. Mm. It's really useful 
it makes a way, kind of like like you said, for people who don't really know, who have these stories, but don't really know where to submit them. It's a really easy way to find specific publishers and stuff where you can submit your stuff. Grindr. Submission grinder, drabble and dribble. <laughs> yep. yep. Laptop dates. Yes. <laughs> I publishing and indie publishing and self publishing. Indie publishing yep. and self publishing. I've learned so much today. In better readers. And what? Better readers. That was a new one for me. What is better readers? I don't know what that is. You, uh, you, you were the one who oh, mentioned it. Oh, beta readers. Beta oh, readers. Beta yes, readers. Yes. Sorry about that. So that was my bad. Like what? <laughs> and beta readers. All right. Okay. So I'm afraid we have to finish off this program uh, today. Time always runs out way too fast. Uh, November seventh, you're yeah. doing a workshop over the noon hour in. Yeah. Where is it located? It's going to be in a founders hall and kind of like the main amphitheater area pavilion Main pavilion in yes pavilion. and we will be selling cookies with little poems in them as well oh like so, uh, like nice. um chinese uh, what are they called fortune cookies there yeah, you go similar yes. to that yeah. i mean the cookies they won't be in the cookies but they'll be in like this bag so we'll have these kind of like bags of cookies and poems that you can get for just a small like three two dollars sounds wonderful and lynn your workshop is november 16th mm-hmm. and we're I believe it's in Founders also. Okay. In, in the, the pavilion. pavilion. Yep. So perfect. So yep. the pavilion is becoming a literary hotbed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. So this is Anna Wasasha. I'm thanking Lynn Paterini today and Brendan Cleary for Thank being you. my guests. Thank and you. It was a lovely show. And if you'd like to learn more about Middlesex Community College, you can find us on the World Wide Web at mxcc.edu. Mm-hmm. I hope you're all having a wonderful day and that the day will continue to be wonderful all night long.